Okay, so what we're going to do in tonight's class is we are going to start by revisiting some of the first class material. We're going to address, I think it's the first three steps in the 10 step process of doing a provision. So we are mostly going to spend our time tonight understanding the current provision, um, current taxes payable, as well as the deferred provision. And so we're going to figure out how to compute um, current tax expense and deferred tax expense. There will be two problems that we do in class uh, throughout the night. And so we'll just break from sort of this lecture mode and you guys will work in groups through the problems. And the problems you'll see have some um, specific questions that I want you to answer. But most of all, whenever I give you a problem, I kind of want you just to do the provision. And when I say do the provision, I mean calculate what the total tax expense is. And then I also want you to do a rate reconciliation. Okay, and I realize for a lot of you that's uh, new and you've seen rate reconciliations now in the Nordstrom's 10K and then also in the NetApp 10K um, where they reconcile the provision at the statutory rate all the way down to whatever their effective rate is. I want you to, get, I want you to be in the habit of doing that too. Okay? So when we get to the problems, expect that we're going to do that. Okay. So uh, last week we talked a lot about the objectives of ASC 740 being balance sheet based. And you would have seen this in the reading. Um, but when we get uh, to the provision uh, exercises tonight, we're going to go through the same process we went through in the first class, which is I want you to first figure out the tax is payable or receivable. And so that first sub bullet under objectives there, that is the current provision. Okay? We're going to figure out how much taxes do we owe and from that step we're going to come up with a journal entry. And the second objective to recognize deferred tax assets or liabilities, that's the, that's the second objective which will in turn help us compute the deferred provision. Okay? So we're going to learn about those in kind of separate modules within tonight's slides, but each of them sequentially, when we compute the current and the deferred provision, will give us the entire, the total provision. Okay. I showed you this, um, this chart last week and tried to show with um, some simple examples how with either the entire calculation of a provision, you could think of you know, the step one, two, three, you know, payable deferred provision. Or the way we showed it in last week's class was with every fact, whether it's book income or a perm item or a temp, we could create a journal entry out of that fact by following the same three-step process, right? So payable, deferred, out comes the provision. And so every row in the schedule like this would have a balanced journal entry. And so tonight when we start focusing on the problems, Think about whether this format helps you or if a different approach helps you. The key to using this, this type of format is you'll know that you get a balanced journal entry um, with every step in the process. Okay. So basics to remember. So the first bullet, matching rule, right? So we're doing tax provisions on an accrual basis. If you read the NetApp disclosure, um, you will see that the total provision expense that they accrued doesn't look really anything like the cash taxes that they paid. And we didn't get into that discussion with um, the guest speakers, but in some of the disclosures that we, or the companies that we read for homework, that's one of the first things we're gonna drill into as a group, okay? Look at the total provision, try to figure out how much they're paying in cash taxes, and then let's talk about what the differences are. Having you understand that difference, that's important. But underlying the income statement expense that's on the P&L will always be the matching rule concept. Um, the second bullet, we kind of touched on this with the guest speakers about computing the provision jurisdiction by jurisdiction. So when George was asking about that, um, rate reconciling item related to the IRS exam, that had to do with the fact that if you think about a company's provision as, um, think about a, country, a company that's in three countries, right? Like country A, B, and C. 
it's almost as if you would do the provision for that company in three separate columns for A, B, and C, and then add them up. And so say that company or country A's tax rate is 35, say it's the U.S., and, and company or country B's tax rate is 10%, and country C is zero. Well, then as you move income between those columns, right, between 35, 10, and zero, the total tax provision is going to change because of the relative weighting of income times the tax rate, right? So the game that people try to play or the strategy that companies try to employ is to move income to the lowest jurisdiction possible, right? So simplistically, you want to move income from country A, which I said had a 35% rate, to country C, which has a 0% rate. And the key is to be able to do that in a supportable way, right? You can't just artificially do that. But when you compute a provision, you compute a provision jurisdiction by jurisdiction. So nobody asked the guest speakers how many countries NetApp is in, but the answer is probably a lot. When they compute their provision, they don't just compute one provision. They compute lots of provisions. So they'll compute a provision for the UK and for France and for Germany and wherever, and then they'll add them up. And so a company that is big and complicated might have lots of columns in sort of my make-believe you know, process. But really what they're doing is the same provision process over and over again. Okay? So when you compute a provision, you're really computing it jurisdiction by jurisdiction at a time and summing it up. Okay? There's a buddy of mine who, uh, um, in fact, he used to work at Deloitte with me when uh, Lee was at Yahoo and um, the three of us work together. He now has uh, a job similar to Lee at a big company in the Midwest. And his, um, his company consolidates 1,200 entities at year end. And they do it like in a matter of hours. It's pretty impressive. But really, although you're like, oh, that sounds so hard, it's just you know, 1,200 of the same provisions being added up, right? And so while, while volume is somewhat difficult to manage, it doesn't mean it's harder, it just means it's more, right? So when we compute provisions for multinational companies, we're going to do it jurisdiction by jurisdiction, okay, and add them up. Um, okay, the, the bullets on the right, we're going to talk about ad nauseum tonight. Okay, temporary uh, terminology. Temporary differences. Okay, so um, Kyle, give me an example of a temporary difference. Depreciation. Depreciation. Why is it a temporary difference? Okay, because it it differs. The timing of the item differs between book and tax law, right? Okay. Um, Rumi, this is my way of just figuring out how many of your names I know. <laughs> Rumi, give me an example of a permanent difference. Um, is it meal meals and entertainment. Okay, and why is that a permanent difference? It's because it's non-deductible, right? and it will never be deductible, all right? Okay, so Ozzy, how would you define the current tax provision? Um, current tax provision is um, current tax plus deferred uh, asset or liability? No, so that would be the total tax provision. Yeah. The current tax provision is the expense that a company would accrue to account for the taxes that are currently payable or receivable. Okay. The current tax provision is the amount that the expense that a company would ac record to accrue the tax for that current year. Um, Shri, how would you how would you describe the deferred tax provision? This one's sort of harder because we haven't touched on this too much. The 
So the deferred tax provision is the tax you would pay in the future. So that's possible. So if you, if you read the guidance, the deferred tax provision is the change in deferreds. But that's sort of an abstract thing for somebody that doesn't understand provisions to start with. Right? So the deferred tax provision is the expense that you're recording in the current period to match with this period's income that may or may not result in current taxes due. So I like to think of like the easiest example of explaining a deferred tax provision as, um, let's say that a company has an NOL carry forward. Okay, so last year they lost money and they set up a deferred tax asset um, to reflect the fact that in the future they're gonna save tax. And this year they're profitable. So this year's profits are simply going to be offset by last year's loss. So we're not going to have a current tax expense this year because we don't owe any tax. But we do have a deferred provision because we're using the deferred tax asset that we set up last year. So if we had a deferred tax asset set up at the beginning of last year anticipating this thing, this savings, and we use that asset, we'll credit the asset, and we'll debit deferred provision. So there, you have an expense to match with your current period income, but that expense will be a deferred expense because you're using a deferred tax asset. Okay? So the deferred tax provision is the expense related to the current year income, but it's resulting in a movement in the deferreds because the deferred expense is equal to the change in deferreds. Again, we'll, we'll spend more time on that at, later on in the class. Uh, the total tax provision is, Ozzy, what you talked about earlier, um, which is the sum of the current and deferred provision. Return to accrual adjustment. So we haven't covered this uh, yet in class. We'll cover, it, uh, we'll cover it later, so I'm just gonna skip over it. Um, a deferred tax asset. Um, Priyesh, is that how, did I pronounce it right? Yeah. So describe what a deferred tax asset is. So it's the benefit of which we want to uh, get in the future years, which we get having to work. Tax benefit that we can get. Okay. So give me give me one example of a deferred tax asset. Give me an example of a deferred tax asset. We'll, we'll let Aaron save you. Aaron? Uh, NOL. An NOL, right? So in the future, you'll save tax. And so that NOL carry forward you're sitting on today, that'll be a deferred tax asset. So what's the difference between a deferred tax asset and a temporary difference? Those things sound like the same. What is the difference? Tom, what do you think the difference is? Simpler than that. You step, right? Yeah. It's, the it's the tax effect of the temporary difference, right? So if Aaron says my company has a hundred dollar NOL, the deferred tax asset for that hundred dollar NOL, thirty five. Right? The deferred tax asset is simply the tax measure of the reversal of that temporary difference. So if in the future I will carry forward $100 and save or offset my tax with that at attribute, the amount of tax I'll save is the tax effect, right? Uh, valuation allowances we'll cover later. Um, unrecognized tax benefit. We sort of touched on this one earlier uh, in the first class, but, uh, but not much. Um, Hi. 
Do you remember what a uh, unrecognized tax benefit is? Where's Sweet Young? Are you are you Sweet Young? Who's Sweet Young? Who is my FTB auditor from last week? Uh, so, help Kai. Tell tell Kai what an unrecognized tax benefit is. Wait, say you have to speak louder. I can't hear you. Oh, don't read the slides. Think of why I called on you. <laughs> I'll stop picking on you too, by the way. Okay, I'll help you. I'll help you one, one last time. The reason I would pick on her is because an unrecognized tax benefit is the reserve a company would accrue for taxes that they haven't voluntarily paid, but they think they might need to pay. And they've accrued it as a reserve so that their liability uh, their liabilities on the balance sheet reflect the correct amount of exposure on a gap basis. So did anybody see in NetApp's um, 10K how much their unrecognized tax benefits were? Don't look. Just guess. Does anybody know? Like, what did you say? Ozzy goes with $8 million. Michael? $8 billion. <laughs> Okay, Michael thinks 90 million. Anybody else? We got 8 million and 8 billion, depending on which one you believe, mm -hmm. and 90 million. Yeah, you're lucky now. You remember. <laughs> it's $272 million. All right? So as you look at public company 10Ks, look at that number. Um, it'll be all over the place. Like Nordstrom's, I think, was 15 million. Right? Like, that's nothing. Right? If you're the IRS and you pick up two 10Ks and you're like, which one of these should I audit? <laughs> right? You're like, I think I'm going to go talk to the NetApp guys. Mm -hmm. Right? So, but again, you can't tell in that disclosure if that's the U.S. federal exposure or if that's state or if it's foreign. You don't know. Right? Um, but public 10Ks will always include that disclosure, so you should look at it and see what it uh, see what it tells you. Um, effective tax rate, uh, Luis, what's uh, what's an effective tax rate? How would you define it? Um, Wait, say it one more time, Luis. Okay, what did Luis get wrong? Total tax expense, right? Our total tax expense. One thing that you might have noticed about the um, NetApp 10K is if you looked at um, their rate reconciliation, what's their effective tax rate? What was it? 14.9. 13.9. But do you notice what's weird about that? Like, do you see 13.9 on the page? No. Right? you got to do the math. So it's kind of annoying, right? Yeah, North right? Nord Nordstrom's was in percentages, I think, weren't they? So it's funny that some companies will report that schedule in percentages and others in numbers. And I always think the companies that do it in numbers, it's, it's strange. Because that just means the reader has to sit there and either get a calculator out or do the math on their head. Because usually people are interested in percentages. Um, the disclosure rules allow you to do it either way. So neither is right or wrong, or both are correct. Um, but you'll see as we look at different companies' disclosures, some do it with percentages and some do it with numbers. The 13.9 includes the unrecognized tax benefits. So the 13.9 should be the, um, let's see, I have it up on the screen here. 
13.9 should be this 152.9 right here, the total tax expense. Uh, you're looking at this year? Okay, fine. So, so if you're looking at this year, it should be the total tax expense of 103 divided by PBT of 740. Right? The 103 should include the current, the deferred, and all of the, you know, what I'll call FIN 48 or tax reserve issues. So just like how in the following year, uh, this year, you see how the item that George was pointing out, the $46 million charge, how that's included in the provision. So that would be included in the effective tax rate because it's a component of the provision. And what that 46 represents is an additional expense for settling an exam, right? Most times when you read other companies' public disclosures, you'll find that that line item, if there's like a settlement or something like that, I mean, they'll always use different words. Usually it'll be a negative item because most companies en end up being over-reserved. Um, in this case, they were under-reserved. That's, uh, that's rare. Exactly. So this 270 right here, yeah, that's a roll forward. So every year, you know, they take last year's 235, put it up here to the beginning of this year, and then they explain how this year's beginning balance gets to this year's ending balance. So they say, oh, we set up new reserves, we set up reserves for older years, but we did it this year because we sort of, I don't know, had, had some different feelings about it. We, reserve, we reversed some reserves, we settled some reserves. You know, the idea is that this table is helpful to a reader to understand how a company is managing its tax exposures. That's the idea. Okay, and then rate reconciliation, which you'll get plenty, plenty of practice with later. Okay. So I think we've gone through these terms. Okay, so let's do in-class exercise number one. So now here's the deal. Most of you were good, and you sat by people you didn't know. Uh, so remember, I noticed, not all of you um, have short-term memory. So sit by people you don't know. It will help you. Um, what I want you to do is pair up in groups like two or three or four, I don't really care, and I want you to do the problem together. Okay. The way that the in-class exercise number one works is it gives you a bunch of facts, and I'll just pull it up on the, the board here. It gives you all these facts, right? It tells you what book income is, it gives you the book tax differences, and then it asks you a series of questions, okay? But at the end of the day, what I really want to know, I want you to answer the questions, but I want you to tell me what the provision is and what the effective tax rate is and try to prepare a rate reconciliation. And I realize we've never done a rate reconciliation, and so that might be hard for some of you. Um, we will do it together on the board, so don't sweat it. But if you follow the three-step process that we talked about in last week's class of what's the payable, then what's the deferred, and out comes the provision, you will be fine, okay? So um, buddy up with people. Don't do it by yourself. Um, get to the right answer by comparing notes and kind of going, you know, going along this together. Okay, so I'm going to do the, the problem, and by way of doing the problem, we'll just answer all the questions, okay? And so um, I think what I'll do within class exercise one is I'll just show you how I would calculate it, and then you guys follow along, and then we'll figure out um, how you do it differently, or um, if you have questions about, like, 
how I'm doing it along the way. We can do it that way. Um, but let me just sort of kind of go through it um, with my method here. Okay. So remember, the first step um, we're going to go through when we calculate a provision is we're going to calculate the current taxes payable. All right. So let's calculate the current taxes payable, which uh, is question C in the in the exercise. So we start with um, PVT, which was a hundred thousand. And we're going to adjust it for uh, book tax differences. So we had total meals and entertainment of 5,000, which means that half of that is an add back. So we're going to add back 2,500. And by the way, whenever I do this, I'm like notorious for like skipping over facts or making a silly mistake. So um, you should watch me carefully instead of just assuming I get it right. Um, so we have meals and entertainment of 5,000. So we're going to add back half of that. Uh, we have tax depreciation, which exceeds book depreciation by 10000 So we're going to make a depreciation adjustment, which is a deduction of 10000 Armstrong's prepaid insurance balance increased 2000 during the year. So if the prepaid increased, that means we're going to take a deduction for tax purposes that exceeds books by 2000 Armstrong recorded 8,000 of interest income from municipal bonds. So that means that um, that's tax exempt interest. We'll just call that TEI. And that will be a deduction of 8,000. Sure. Yeah, so Yusuf is asking about the prepaid insurance balance increasing by 2,000. So if the prepaid insurance balance increases by 2,000, prepaid insurance. Okay. Um, so again, just to, it's fine to kind of slow down. So prepaid insurance, whenever we pay it, it's deductible for tax, but it's not necessarily deductible for books until it covers the, the period that the insurance covers. So when you say the prepaid balance increased, that means tax gets a deduction, but books has yet to expense it. Okay, so we're going to accelerate a tax deduction. That's what that means. Uh, the bad debt reserve increased by 7,000. So if the reserve is increasing by 7, we can't deduct a reserve until we discharge um, uh, the debt. So there's a book expense of 7,000, but it's not tax deductible. So we'll say bad debt reserve of 7,000 is an add back. And it says our tax rate's 40%. So if I sum up all of those amounts um, to get to my taxable income, what, uh, what is my taxable income? 89.5, right? And so if my tax rate is 40%, my current tax expense it's 35.8, right? Okay, so we figured out step one. Our current tax liability is 35,800. So if we were gonna book a journal entry related to that, we would say that that is credit payable for 35.8 and debit expense for 35. Okay, so that is our current expense. Now, let's figure out what our deferreds are. So that was question E. What is the journal entry to book our deferred tax expense? So if we go through our items and figure out our book tax differences and figure out what are our temporary differences, um, what are our temporary differences? So we know that depreciation is a temp item. And is that going to create, assuming we started the year with zero, a blank slate, are we going to have a temporary difference that will give rise to future deductions or a future tax liability? Uh, so Emily, the 10,000, what, what is that? Is that a future 
benefit or a future bad guy? Bad guy. Okay. So we're going to carve out a little section here for, for our deferred. This will be step one. And this will be step two. So we have depreciation, which we're going to say is going to give rise to a bad guy of 10000 um, Insurance. So Stephanie, in insurance, is that going to give rise to a future deduction or will there be future book expense with no tax deduction? The second one. Exactly, the second one. So we already deducted the insurance when we paid it, which means in the future when there's book expense for that insurance, there won't be a tax deduction. Right? So that will also be a bad guy. Um, tax exempt interest. Is, uh, is that a t temporary difference, um, Lynn? That's a permanent item. Good. Okay. Uh, or oh, Ivy. Okay, so we have bad debt reserve. So that's a temporary difference. Is that a future deduction or a future bad guy? Future deduction. Bad debt. That's 7000 Okay, so if we sum all of our temporary items, we have a net bad guy of 5000 so the tax rate on that is 40% or 2,000. So in the future, if all of our timing differences reverse, we will owe 2,000 of tax, right? So the journal entry to record that, I know I'm kind of running out of space, would be credit DTL 2,000, debit expense 2,000. So, step one was figuring out what is our taxes payable. It's 35.8. Step two is figuring out how much our future taxes are. It's two. So, we are going to credit taxes payable, 35.8, and credit deferred taxes, I don't know what I did there, but credit deferred taxes, two. We're going to pay 35 now. We're going to pay two later. We're going to pay a total of 37. Okay. So now, our total provision, total provision is 37.8, and our PBT was 100. So our effective tax rate is 37.8. All right. Okay, so now we are going to do our first ever rate reconciliation. It's going to be super awesome. Okay. So, uh, boy, if we were going to do a rate reconciliation, what two items are we trying to reconcile? What are we going to start with? Well, we're going to... No, you're thinking too hard. We're going to start with PDT of 100. And because our statutory rate is 35%, we're going to assume that any company with a 35% rate would have a 35 provision. Like I said. Detail. Okay. So, boy. Assume I was in a jurisdiction that had a 40% tax rate. I would expect a provision of 40. 
right? But my provision we just calculated is 37.8. So I'm trying to reconcile my 40 to my 37.8. Right? So that second table in every public company's tax footnote is always going to do this reconciliation. Okay? So what items am I going to expect to see, um, Rena? What items am I going to expect to see in my rec reconciliation? Like, what is the nature of these items? Permanent differences, right? Because I'm explaining how my provision changed. Why is it not just simply 40? And like we learned in our family feud game, the answer is permanent differences. Okay. So Chen, give me one item that will help me reconcile the 40 to the 37.8. Meals and entertainment. See, you guys all are learning the lesson that if you go first, you can always say meals and entertainment. <laughs> Okay, so then fine, I wrote the word meals and entertainment. Now what do I do? So what effect does the meals and entertainment have on the provision? So if I started by assuming that my provision should simply be 100 times 40% or 40, what incrementally does meals and entertainment do to the 40? 2,500. Multiplied by 40%. So my 40, which is actually 40,000, will go up by 1,000 of tax, right? My tax is 1,000 higher because of my meals and entertainment add back. Right? Right or wrong? Right. All right. So I would say my two point, I'm doing everything in thousands here, 2.5 times 40% means my provision goes up by one. So my provision expense permanently increases by one because of the permanent add back of meals and entertainment. Hey, fan, will you should open that door? I swear, with so many people in this room, we're all going to die if we don't have two doors open. Okay, so that is one permanent difference. But Chen has taken us in the opposite direction of the answer, right? We were trying to get from 40 to 37.8, and she has taken us down the wrong path. We are now farther away. Okay, so Nitty, what's an example of another perm item? Hey, fan, I think you actually have to put something to stop the door. Yeah, there you go. Um, okay, Nitty, say that one more time. Interest income from municipal bonds. Okay. So what does that do for us, Nitty? Let's speak up. You guys are forgetting the lesson from the class number one of speaking. Wait, say it louder, sorry. You're making me feel like I'm deaf. So we have tax, so you're on a roll. Tax exempt interest, the good thing, permanent benefit, right? Income that's permanently non taxable. So this is great. So how much is it? 8,000. So how much tax is 8,000 of tax free income going to save us? 3,200, right? So I have 8,000, which is a good guy, 40%, 3.2. And so if I take my 40 that I started with and I increase it by my 1 for my Mills and Entertainment and decrease it by my 8 for my municipal bonds, I get 37.8, right? All right, there's the first ray rack. So easy, huh? So cool. Okay, 
So the key is when you do your provision, do it step one, two, three, right? Do the payable, calculate the deferreds, I'll come to you in a second, come up with the provision, right? Payable, 35.8, deferred is two in this example. So we get our total provision of 37. And then step back and figure out, well, can I explain the effective rate? Could I reconcile the effective rate looking at perm items? Right? And here we've identified two perm items, we've quantified the effect of those perm items, and we can reconcile our rate from what it should be at the statutory rate down to what our effective rate is. Perfect. So if you can do that with some more facts that make it harder, man, you're going to have a great time in the exam. It won't even be hard, it'll just be plain fun. All right. So, uh, Marissa's question yeah, revolves around the presentation of deferred expense. And the answer is, I don't care. What is important to me is that, um, A, you can compute the total expense correctly, and then B, you understand that in the context of a public uh, footnote, there's the first table that you have to present requires you to break out current expense from deferred expense. So it's important for you to know how to do that. So in my example, what would go in the footnote for this company would be my current expense would be this, right? And my deferred expense would be that number. Okay? So you're gonna be able, you're gonna need to know of my thirty seven point eight of total expense, how much is current and deferred. How you record the journal entries, it doesn't make a difference to me. And if you notice the way I did the solution, I didn't do the fact by fact approach of, okay, meals and entertainment, I'm gonna come up with a journal entry. Prepaid insurance, I'll come up with a journal entry. Sort of like we had illustrated in the first class. Here, I just did it in total, right? I did the total payable, I did the total deferred. If you wanted to, like if this, if what I showed you was difficult, if you wanted to go back and show the, the in-class exercise one, like every fact having a journal entry, you could absolutely do that. You'll get to the exact same answer. Okay? It's just a way, it's just a method on how you do it. Okay. All right, other questions on that? That was it. Wait, <laughs> sorry. Can you say? Sorry, I was waiting for the next part. Exactly. So when you have temporary items, um, you know, temporary items are going to cause deferred tax assets or liabilities. The change in the deferred tax assets or liabilities are what's going to cause the deferred provision because the deferred provision will be your change in deferred. And it's a hard concept to grasp um, until you kind of boil it down to, to sort of the easiest, you know, uh, fact pattern, right? Like if you looked at NetApp's disclosure and you saw what their deferred provision was, it would be very hard for you to articulate what that is. But when you think about it as um, you know, something like you know this fact pattern, we are taking deductions now in this example for depreciation and prepaid insurance to save tax today, but we're just gonna pay it in the future. So it's very logical then to say, oh, my current expense is slightly lower, 
but my deferred expense makes up for that because I'll just pay it in the future. And that increase in the deferred liability is my deferred expense, right? And that's me just telling the reader, sure, my total expense is 37. I'm just paying 35 now and I'll have to pay another couple later. What I pay now, I call current expense. What I pay later, I call deferred, right? I mean, that's all it is. Once you start mixing in lots of deferreds, deferred expense gets a little tricky. All right, any more questions on that? Okay. Okay, so in class exercise one, we sort of did a complete provision, al although it's very basic, okay? So now if we sort of step back and we talk a little bit about um, the first objective, the current payable or receivable, when we're calculating current expense or the current payable, we're gonna do a calculation just like the tax return. So just like how I illustrated um, going through that problem where I started with book income and I adjusted for both permanent and temporary di items, that's the same thing you're going to do in computing the current um, expense or liability. Uh, I think that should be pretty straightforward if you have any familiarity with um, corporate tax, corporate taxable income. The same thing as doing a tax return. There's all sorts of differences between book or tax. The key for you is to make sure that as you understand what those differences are, that you've inventoried them as either permanent or temporary, right? We need to know, we need to know that right off the bat. <coughs> okay, so we have another problem that we'll just kind of talk through as a class. Um, the company has um, a million dollars of income, and this is after tax expense of 300 grand. The tax rate's 35%, and the state rate is 7%. Okay, so this is the first place that we've talked about a tax rate where there's a different uh, federal rate from a state rate. Okay. And states can get sort of thorny here. And my, if my recollection is right, we're going to assume that state taxes are deductible for federal purposes in the current year. Okay, so some state taxes, like in California, you pay them one year and then you deduct them the next year for federal. It's on a lag basis. But in this example, we're going to assume that any state taxes we pay, we get to deduct in the current period. Okay. So let's just go through our facts. Um, we have a million of income after tax expense of 300 grand, tax rate for 35 and 7. And then we list out our um, book tax differences. So we have tax depreciation, which is favorable. Uh, we have meals and entertainment, inventories and penalties, a 199 deduction, um, some bad debt reserves, and some bonuses. Okay. So this is sort of a typical list of book tax differences that a company might have. Okay, so if we were going to compute our current tax payable, the question is how are we going to do it? So we're going to start with net income for books before tax. So remember, we said that the million was after tax, but it included 300000 So our PBT is actually... 1.3 million, All right? Okay, so perm items. What are our perm items? Chen, would you like to go first again? Say what you said before. <laughs> That's why I picked on you. Boom! 
Boom. Jen, you're going to realize you are our Meals and Entertainment queen. <laughs> How much is the Meals and Entertainment add back, Jen? 5000 5, Now you can rest easy. I won't call on you for a little while. <laughs> but look out for that next Meals and Entertainment. It's coming your way. Okay. Sui Young, give me another example of a perm item and don't look slides ahead. You can look at the facts of the problem, though. What's another perm item? Fines and penalties. That's 2,000, right? Okay. What's another perm item that Chris would laugh at if he was here? Hey, Duan, what's another perm item? Section 199, 14,000, right? Remember, Chris was making fun of me for saying that was so uncommon, but it's so common this company has it. All right, temporary item. Megan, give me an example of temporary item. Depreciation. So that we have tax depreciation over book of 75,000, right? Okay, what's another example of a temp item? Luis. Inventory adjustment. I think they mean Unicap. That's fine. So we're going to add back 50000 right? Okay. Shimao, what's another temp item? Bad debit. Bad debt reserves. Okay, so we're we gonna add back. Are we gonna add that back or deduct it? Add it back. We're gonna add back forty-five thousand for bad debt reserves. Okay. And Alex, what's our last perm uh, temp item? Bonus. We're gonna deduct or add that. Add it. Okay. So that's thirty thousand. We're gonna add back. Okay, so now we get to a subtotal. So that subtotal is 1343000. Okay. Our state tax rate is 7%. Okay, Hoy. Why do we So you are our state at tax expert, right? In addition to your friend Megan why do we calculate state tax first instead of after federal, right? Like the wrap on state tax people is nobody cares because federal comes first and then there's state. But now in this thing, we're doing state first. Why are we doing state first? You're welcome to help her, Megan, if you want. State tax is deductible for federal purposes, right? So in order to figure out what we're going to deduct for federal purposes, we got to know what our state tax is, right? All right, so we're going to calculate our state tax first, and 7% of 1343 is 94,010. So we are going to deduct the 94,010 from the 1343 in order to figure out what our federal taxable income is. So our federal taxable income is going to be 1248990. And 35% of that is 437.147. So our total 
current expense is 531157. Okay, because that is the sum of our state tax expense of 94 and our federal tax expense of 437. Okay? So that would be a typical calculation of a current tax expense. Okay? Tina? Why do we add the inventory back? The reason we add the inventory back is um, 263 cap A tends to take um, expenses which um, would ordinarily be deducted and they get capitalized to inventory. And those costs that get capitalized to inventory aren't deducted until the inventory is sold. So certain GNA costs for tax purposes um, might be capitalized where for books they're expensed. That's what 263A does. Okay. So when you're doing a current expense calc, we're going to do just like a tax return. Start with book income, go through book tax differences, um, state first, so we know what our federal deduction for states are, and then out comes our federal taxable income once we deduct our state tax liability. Okay. All right, questions on that? Okay, so hold this thought, and depending on kind of how our time goes tonight, um, what I might come back and take this example and just do the entire provision. Like all we've shown here is the current provision. But uh, if we have time uh, later, we'll come back and do the deferred provision for this exact example, and we'll do a rate rec and show you how the whole thing works. Okay? Unless you guys want to suffer through that now. You want to suffer through it now? Okay. Because we're having fun. Okay. Okay, so we know our current provision is 531157. But here's the way here's the way that I would do it. What this confuses is um, this sort of confuses Fed and State because it does it on one cal one page, one calculation. So my advice to you when we're doing provisions that have both federal and state is to break them into two provisions. Okay? Do a state provision and do the whole thing, and then move on and do the federal provision. Okay? Once you start mixing federal and state, it will confuse you. And then when something goes wrong, it'll be hard for you to identify what went wrong. Okay? So if we did this provision for state purposes first, let's do it this way. So my PBT was a million three. I had meals and entertainment of twenty five hundred. Or oh, sorry, that's wrong. Uh, five thousand, right? So I had meals entertainment of five thousand. I have uh, penalties of two thousand. One ninety nine, fourteen thousand. And stuff. One of you will ask whether it's really a deduction for state, and assume the answer is yes. Um, that's that's not always the case. In fact, it's mostly not the case. But that's the case for this example. Um, we have depreciation. Of 75, it's a deduction. 
263A of 50. Bad debt, 45. And bonus of 30. Okay, so the sum of that is 1343. And the state tax expense of that is 94010. Okay? That is step one for my state provision. I owe 94,010. Right? So I would credit my payable and debit expense for 9410. Okay? That's step one. Step two is I would identify my deferreds. Okay? So I have depreciation, which is going to be 75, bad guy, meaning in the future I'll have book expense but no corresponding tax depreciation. In the future I'll have inventory deductions, because this year I'm adding back, but in the future I'll get a benefit, so I'll get a 50 deductible temporary difference. Bad debt reserve works almost exactly the same, whereas in the future I'll get a deduction of 45, and same with bonus. Okay. So, my, def my deferreds are uh, 95 to 20, looks like 50. Right? So 7% on 50 should be 3,500. So my second entry, my second step is going to be debit ETA credit expense for 3,500. So my total provision is going to be the sum of 9,410 and 3,500. But the 9410 is a debit and the 3500 is a credit. And the reason is, the reason that 3500 is a credit is I'm building DTAs. So as I build DTAs, I'm getting, I'm earning a benefit, a tax provision benefit. Okay. So 9410 minus 3500 should be 90. 510. So my total state provision should be 9510. Okay, right? Okay, questions on that? I can send you these slides too, by the way. So don't worry if you're not getting it all. So right now, all we're doing is state provision. So I want you to think, remember early in class I said you do provisions jurisdiction by jurisdiction? Federal and state, different jurisdictions. So we're doing state first. That's our first jurisdiction. We just finished the state provision. Okay. We did state step one, state step two, state step three. Okay. We got it. And if we wanted to do a rate rack of just our state provision, we could do one. We're not going to, but we could. Okay. All right, so now we got to move on to federal. Okay. Time, time. All right, so if we were doing our federal provision, um, here we're going to shortcut a little bit because we've done some of the work from the prior, um, the prior analysis. So we know in step one, uh, oops, whatever that was wasn't good. So we know in step one that we can start with um, TI of 1343 three before our federal deduction for state tax. Right? 
right? Because we already computed that when we did state taxable income. And then we know we get a deduction of 94,010, which is our state tax. So we'll call that TI before state. And this is our state. So this will really be TI. And TI was 1248,990. And our tax rate is 35%. So we said our tax is 437,147. Okay. That is step one. Debit expense, credit payable. So that's what we learned in the last uh, exercise that was in the slides. But now um, we're going to move on and we're going to do step two. So step two is identifying the deferreds. And so let's just list them out separately because I think it'll make it easier. Let's see. So depreciation was 75. That's a bad guy. Inventory was 50, which is a good guy. In the future, that'll be a deduction. Bad debt is a good guy in the future, because that'll be a future deduction, and so will bonus. Now, here's the advanced part. What is the other deferred? So, whereas for state, Remember in my scribbling for state, there was four deferreds right here. Appreciation, inventory, bad debt, and bonus. But for federal, we have the same four, but there's one more. They pass. All right, well, who wants to try to explain that in English? Do you want to explain it in English? Hard to explain, huh? <laughs> this is hard for people. So let me give you a, a better example. Um, not a better example than what you said. I'm just saying, let me give you a better fact pattern example. Like, let's say that we um, depreciated all of our fixed assets immediately. Okay? We, we were able to expense them. But books hasn't. So we've accelerated our depreciation. And that means that we're going to have a deferred tax liability, right? Because in the future, books will have an expense to amortize the asset. The tax won't. We already depreciated the asset. It's accelerated. Okay? And so in the future, we're going to owe more state tax because of the fact that we don't get any more tax depreciation, right? So the deferred liability we have represents future tax above and beyond what the future book income would suggest. Are you all with, with me on that? So when you see deferred tax liability, you think, oh, there's going to be a future tax. Okay. If there's a future tax, there's also going to be a future federal deduction. Right? Because any time you pay state tax, you get a federal deduction. But you have to wait to take the federal deduction until you pay the state tax. So that means every time there's a state deferred, there is a federal deferred in the opposite direction. So in my example with the accelerated depreciation, if there's a state deferred liability, the 
because we've already deducted the asset for state purposes, but Fultz hasn't. That means in the future, when that deferred liability becomes taxes due, I will get a federal deduction. So for every dollar of state DTL, there should be a 35 cent federal DTA. Okay? Because in that next year, when I pay that additional dollar of state tax, I will save 35 cents of federal tax. Okay? All right. You said. You don't look confused. I'm just joking. Is the state tax deductible for book purposes? Well, the state tax will be a component of your provision. I think the question you're trying to ask is, the state tax deduction works like a perm difference in computing your federal provision. So when you compute your federal provision, you look and you say, ah, look at this. I get a deduction for state taxes. What a great thing, right? That wasn't in pre-tax income, but yet I still get a deduction for it out of finance. So that deduction is a term. While, of course, you have to accrue the state tax separately as a bad guy, you do get a federal benefit for every dollar of state tax you do incur. Okay. So in this example, it's confusing. The numbers are flipped from my more basic example. In, in this example, my state tax deferred is actually a DTA of 3500 So what that means is in the future, you're going to save 3500 of state tax. So in the future, when you deduct the bonus, and then you deduct the inventory reserves and all that stuff for verses, you're going to save state tax. But when you save state tax, that means that in the future you will also get less of a federal deduction than you would have otherwise got. Okay? So when you think about the temporary differences you have, one of the differences is now the timing for your ability to deduct state taxes. I know. Confusing. Mm -hmm. Well, so you said the question was, is that a tax-to-tax -tax difference rather than a book-to-tax -tax difference? This one is a difficult item to... The state tax deduction is difficult to define as a temporary item because there really is no book equivalent. Right? It's sort of like an NOL, if you think about it. Like there's not a book NOL and a tax NOL, right? There's just a tax value. And the same thing is true with the federal deduction for state tax. There's just the federal deduction for state tax. There's not really a book equivalent. So in our example, for when we're going through step two and we're inventorying our federal deferreds, we're going to look at our state tax DTA of 3500 and that will become um, a federal DTL of 3500 Because as we save state tax in the future, we will lose a federal deduction we would otherwise have. Here's where you're going to have to check to see if I did the math right. I think I did. Thank you. 
doing anything. Okay, so I computed our federal deferred asset as being 16275 by adding up our federal temp items, including our federal deduction for state effect of 3500 and tax affecting the whole thing at 35%. So that would be step number two. So I would debit DTA and I would credit expense. So the sum of those two. If I did the math right, it should be 420, 872. Okay. With me so far? So notice that, um, notice that in my federal provision, I have taken a benefit for the state tax provision, but I've done it in two places. I've taken a current benefit here. So my federal provision reflects a benefit from my current state tax expense, but it does so in the, the federal current provision. The state tax benefit reflects a federal detriment here. So it's confusing because the signs go the same direction, at least the way it's presented. But here, the 94000 that's a benefit. That's lowering my federal current expense. Having the 3500 here is increasing my deferred liabilities for federal which has the effect of crediting deferred and debiting expense. So it's going the opposite direction. Okay. All right. So if we took the 420.872. So we said our federal provision was 4. 20872 420 and our state provision was 9510 so that means our total provision Five eleven three eighty two. Okay. So now, if we tried to do a rate reconciliation of five eleven three eighty two. Let's see if we can figure this thing out. So we started with PBT of one three zero zero and at thirty five percent that would be four hundred and fifty five thousand. Okay, and we get to our total provision of five eleven three eighty two. All right, so if we were going to do a rate rec to get us from 455 to 511.382, what items are we going to throw in there as a difference? Oh, don't steal Chen Thunder. Chen. Hi. 
Daniels Entertainment. Okay, so that is five thousand. I'm gonna put that right here for Meals and Entertainment at thirty-five percent. It's gonna be seventeen fifty. So you got us almost nowhere close to the answer. Okay. Who wants to suggest another reason that uh, the provision needs to be reconciled before between 455 and 1750? Jocelyn. Find the penalty. Okay, how much is that? 2000, right? And so the number I would put here is the tax effect of that. So 700, right? Okay. Now, what's left? 199. Okay, that's 14,000. So 14,000 times 35. Forty-nine hundred. That's a good guy. Okay. Megan. Oh, sorry. What's next, Megan? State taxes. Okay. What am I going to put for state taxes? Ninety thousand five ten. That is our state tax provision. Okay. What are we missing? Say that one more time. Seven point seven percent of the what point one million? One point three million. Um mm, uh oh. No. I'll explain in a second. Alright, what are we missing? We're missing one conceptual thing. State deferred tax asset. No, because the 9510 is the total state provision. Right? When we calculated the state provision in the first step when we were doing this jurisdiction by jurisdiction, 9510 was the entire state provision. And when we're doing our rate rec, this 455, this is just 35%. So that's just federal. So because we're now showing our total provision, we need to start with federal and add state. And these perms are just the federal effect of the perms because the state effect of the perms is already in the 9510. Right? Right. Well, you should have stopped with like two words to go. So Rena had it. The federal effect of the state provision. Because this 9510, that's just the state provision. Nowhere in here yet have we captured the fact that the state provision will have a federal benefit. Right? So that 9510 someday should save us state ta or federal tax. 
So 9510 times 35% is 31678. And that is a good guy. And we're going to call that F boss. Federal benefit of state. So every dollar we pay in state tax, we will save 35 cents in federal tax. So when we accrue a 90510 of state tax expense, we will get a federal benefit of 31678 So while I don't know because I didn't add it up, if you add that up, it should work. Did you, did you add it up? Oh. Gotta watch out for Ozzy. He's tricky. He's backing into it. He's like, the answer is 31,000. I just don't know what that is. It's right sloppy and maybe we'll give you half that. So the F boss is like a perm. Right. And so sometimes, if you were to look at the, um, uh, oh, I think I deleted or I closed the, um, the NetApp 10 k But if you read the rate reconciliation for the NetApp 10 k it would surely show you the state tax line as net of federal effect. So what you would see is you would see on a rate reconciliation, you would see these two numbers. Those two numbers are normally going to be netted in the presentation of a rate rec. Okay. Okay. So. What we just did was probably harder than we needed to do in a second class. So if you're like, oh my god, I should drop this immediately. <laughs> I understand. What I want you to take away from that, though, is, one, sort of take your time and go slow. There's no, like, there's no, you know, award you get from running through something, getting it wrong, and getting frustrated. So go slow. The second thing is, rem remember how I did the state provision first? and then the federal provision, always do that. Never try to do the Fed and state combined. It will mess you up. And as soon as you can't get it to work, you'll realize how much undoing you have to do. So do, do it in parts. So much like how I said, if you wanted to do the provision like journal entry by journal entry for every fact, you could do it that way. But you could also at least break down the provision jurisdiction by jurisdiction. So you can get the state right and then move on and get the federal right. Okay? So the purpose of the could you Unless I tell you differently, anything I say is a book tax difference will be true for Fed and state. In reality, there's tons of differences. So like, you know, Amazon, for example, they, they do their state provision, every state, every entity, there's like 300 and something of them. And they all have, you know, they start with different legal entity income, they have different book tax differences, they have Fed state adjustments. It's just a ton of differences, but it all adds up, right? So while it looks complicated because of the volume, it's really just a lot of individual provisions that add up. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to blow through the next couple sections because that we have more fun than we bargained for. Okay. So, Step two in our process was computing the current provision. I think you get the hang of the current provision, right? It's like doing your tax return and out comes a journal entry. Step number three in the process is sometimes when you're doing the provision, you don't get it right the first time. 
So remember how when we were talking to the guest speakers and they told you how little time they have to compute their provision? Sometimes what that means is you have to just estimate things, right? If you only have a matter of like a day or hours to compute all the book tax differences, there's just no way that's going to happen. So if you estimated, like let's say that Chen is in charge of meals and entertainment, right, which apparently she is. So if, if you know, the provision director comes to her and says, hey, Chen, what's the meals and entertainment add back? She's like, I don't know. There's too much pressure. It's probably 5,000, right? And she's just guessing. And it turns out that it's not 5,000, but when we file the tax return, it's 6,000, right? So then we have a difference. That difference is referred to as a return to accrual adjustment. Okay? So there can be lots of return to accrual adjustments. Return to accrual adjustments are pretty straightforward, though, when you think about it. So we're just about to finish Q3 for calendar year companies, and Q3 is the quarter in which calendar year companies file their tax return. Okay? So that means if you're a calendar year company, you just filed your tax return that was due September 15, you should now be aware that Chen's estimate of 5,000 was incorrect because your tax return now shows 6,000. Okay? So you have a return to accrual adjustment. So when you did your provision and your provision reflected 5,000, you accrued a payable, let's say your tax rate's 40%. You accrued an increased payable of 2,000, right? Chen says the addback's 5,000. You multiply that by 40%. You say credit payable 2,000, credit or debit expense 2,000. That's what you do. Then Chen takes nine months, studies it really hard, says looks like it's 6,000 and the return reflects 6,000. So then the question is, how do you adjust for the fact that your original estimate was wrong? What do you do? So in Q3, you're gonna look at your payable and say, well, I accrued 2,000, but in fact, I probably should have accrued 2,400, right? So if everything else was perfect on your tax return besides uh, Chen's reckless estimate, Right? I'll pick on somebody else later, don't worry. <laughs> you, it's your mistake for sitting in the front row. Um, so if everything else was perfect on the tax return, except for Chen's estimate, then you need to look at your return and say, gosh, I gotta, I gotta adjust my payable. Like my payable showed I owed 2,000 because of this meals and entertainment, but now I owe more. So I have to credit my payable because I owe more, right? I gotta cut a check to the government. So the first thing I gotta do is credit my payable to set up that liability. So I'm gonna credit payable 400, which is really step one in my process, right? My process is I figure out what my payable. In my return to accrual process, I just do step one, two, three over again, but I really do it for my heirs, my changes in estimate. So my three-step process with respect to comparing return to provision, my first step is I'm under accrued by 400 because of the change in estimate. I credit payable 400. There's nothing about this change in estimate that has a deferred effect because the meals entertainment, as we now learn, is a per item. So the other side of the entry that we're gonna book to update for this change in estimate is expense. So the journal entry that we would book because of the change in estimate would be credit payable 400 and debit expense 400. And that's the same entry that we wish we would have booked all along if we knew, right? If Chen had only told us it was 6,000 instead of 5,000, we would have booked that extra 400 when we did the provision originally. But instead, since we're learning about it now, we booked the 400 debit to provision and the 400 payable now. That is all a return to accrual is. All you're doing is taking the journal entries you booked at year end and updating them to what they should be based upon all the facts you now reflected in your tax return. You said. So that additional 400, would that be disclosed separately in the following year? Because that was where the current year payable was. So that 400, Yusef's question is, well, we, where, where will you see that 400, like when you look at the financial statement? Well, you'll have to see it in the following year because now it's September and you just figured it out. 
And as much as you want to go to Chen and be like, Chen, you should have told me this in January. We're like, what are we doing here? Or like, Chen's like, I did the best I could, right? I told you it was 5,000. It was a pretty rock solid estimate. And uh, it turns out it wasn't like that rock solid. But that extra 400, my example, yeah, will show up in Q3. So the key to having return to accrual adjustments is that they're not so big that you look back and say, man, that is such a big difference. Uh, it's going to be a problem for me to book all that now when it really belonged last year, right? So when return to accrual adjustments are small, it's sort of like no problem. When return to accrual adjustments get big, well, then, then you get into the question of well, why didn't you figure that out originally? And is that an error? And did your process break down? And does somebody need to be punished? And that sort of thing. So with like the thousand with Chen, like we'll let that pass, right? If Chen said, no, there's no meals entertainment this year. It's all good, right? We're going to take a break this year. And then it turned out that wasn't true. Then you'd say, oh, well, that's a pretty blatant return to accrual adjustment. Like we're going to have to have a discussion around how we, how we mess that up, right? But in concept, return to accrual adjustments are really just taking the provision you did and correcting for it. You can correct your payable, you can correct your deferreds, you can correct your expense. It's looking at all three steps and figuring out what's the difference between what you did at the estimate when you did your original provision and what it should have been. And do you disclose that separately in the following year? Do you disclose it separately in the following year? Only if it's so big that it's a problem. Um, in almost like 10 out of 10 cases, it will be shoved under the rug. But does it drive the rate? It depends. So if you had a, let's say you had a depreciation difference. If you guessed that your tax depreciation was 100, but it turned out to be 90, well, then you owe more tax, right? So in step one, your payable should be higher because your tax depreciation isn't as high as you thought. So your tax payable needs to go up. But in step two, your deferred needs to change now because if you didn't take as much tax depreciation, that means that your deferred tax asset or liability for depreciation is going to be a higher DTA. So the payable and the deferred will offset, and there is no provision effect. So having a true up on a temp item is just like having a temp item in the current year where it doesn't impact the rate. So the only return to accrual items that drive a provision are going to be the same items that would have driven a provision in the first place, which will be permite. Okay. But auditors get anxious anytime there's return to accrual adjustments. So the trick with a company is to figure out like what your materiality is and like what types of adjustments you can absorb. Um, because uh, Sharon at uh, Oracle, I'm sure they have a much different tolerance for a return to accrual adjustment at uh, Oracle than they will at a much smaller company. Everybody with me? Yeah. Um, so we go through some simple examples in the slides. You know, I wanted to explain it rather than show it to you in hopes that like hearing it would click. But this is the same sort of thing. You know, like if we assumed a certain amount of book tax differences for penalties and m and &E, and then it turned out to be different, what would be the journal entry to fix it? Same sort of thing that we talked about. You can do the same thing for depreciation. You guys can stare at the slides by yourself and understand how the journal entries work. But know that the return to provision is just an inevitable process that everyone goes through when they file their tax return. And all you're doing is taking the accounts that you set up at provision time and you're fixing them. Okay. When you work in uh, industry or even public accounting, but more so in industry, Anytime there's a return to accrual adjustment, then the question that the auditors will ask is, was that a change in an estimate or was it an error? And so what do you think the answer is? Change in estimate. <laughs> right. One of my clients, the VP tags, he's funny. Anytime something comes up, he'll be like, change in estimate. <laughs> uh, 
you know, he's like just programmed, you know. He got pulled over for speeding. He's like, change an estimate. <laughs> you know, like he, just, he just got it. He's, he's funny. So, um, but this area, I mean, I don't need, we're not going to test you on this kind of stuff, but I just want you to know the sensitivity of this, that when you're doing return to accrual adjustments, the auditors will always ask, is it a change in an estimate or is it an error, right? And as you can probably tell from the description of the word, if it's a change in estimate, it's fine meaning it's fine to accrue it this quarter because now is the first time you could actually get it right. Whereas if it was an error, like let's say Chen told us there was no meals and entertainment this year and then there turned out to be some. Like we would look back and say, Chen, what were you thinking, man? How could you not have seen that there was meals and entertainment? Like it's right there in the GL. And then she'll be like, oh, I skipped that page. <laughs> you know, and you're like, Chen, right? And so that would be an error. And so the auditors would look at that and say, well, okay, now we need to assess, well, what is the effect of making an error? Um, should we restate the prior financial statements if it's big enough? You know, should we assess SOX control? All sorts of things like that. Um, and so the difference between calling something a change in estimate, where, you know, Chen might have said, well, I thought this types of, of you know, meals, like taking a, um, client to lunch was treated differently than saying having a birthday party for an employee and I didn't have the time to figure out like which was which and there's a lot of records and it's hard to get that data and it took time. Like those sorts of things could, could argue for a change in estimate. Whereas if she said I just didn't look at that page, you know, that's an error. Um, so anyways, understand that the difference between the two has a lot of, has a lot of significance. Okay, let's get to deferred provision. This is important. We don't have that much time left. Okay, deferred tax liabilities and deferred tax assets. So as we've discussed before, a deferred tax liability is the tax effect of a taxable temporary difference. And a taxable temporary difference is a temporary item that when it reverses, will reverse in taxable income above book income, okay? So if, for example, um, you know, books recognizes $100 of income, but taxes allowed to defer it, let's say, like it's an installment sale. Well, when we, ha when we pick up that income in the future, under the installment sale rules, that's future taxable income. So that future taxable income, if books already recognize the income, would be a taxable temporary difference. And the tax effect of that would be a deferred tax liability, okay? So that second sub-bullet, it's the future payment for an obligating event that's already occurred, right? So in my installment sale example, we already sold the asset, we already recognize the book gain, but in the future, we're going to have taxation related to that event. So that is a taxable temporary difference that's going to give rise to a deferred tax liability. Okay. Like when you pick up, if you picked up the Yahoo 10K, um, I think I told you I spent a lot of time with them. If you look at their balance sheet, they have one big taxable temporary difference that creates a deferred tax liability. Does anybody know what it is? It's public info. It's obvious. What is Yahoo's famous tax issue? Oh, man, you guys got to read the news. Alibaba, right? Why, do they, why does Yahoo have a deferred tax liability for Alibaba? No, I'm just joking. It's not mail that <laughs> So for book purposes, they account for their investment in Alibaba under the mark-to-market method because Alibaba is a public company, and they value it for book purposes at the market price. Okay? The market price for Yahoo's investment in Alibaba is huge. It's like $40 billion. Yahoo's tax basis in Alibaba is like nothing. 
So that means if Yahoo went out and sold their investment in Alibaba, they would have a massive tax gain, right? That tax gain is just like the second sub-bullet. It's the future tax related to an event that's already occurred. Books has already valued the asset at its fair value, and when tax catches up, there'll be a big tax to pay. So we have a very large taxable temporary difference that will give rise to a deferred tax liability. Okay. So when you look at their balance sheet, you would see a deferred tax liability of like 10 to $15 billion representing the future tax on the sale of that asset. Okay. Deferred tax assets. Okay. So Aaron gave the example before of an NOL. Uh, some companies have big NOLs, right? And if you were the reader of a financial statement, you might want to know, hey, this company's got a lot of NOLs, right? And that might be useful for, for you to value a company. You look at them and say, these guys aren't paying tax for a long time, right? And that's good to know because as they start making money and as they're cash flow positive, they're not going to have to start cutting checks to the IRS. You know, all those earnings are going to come straight through the cash flow statement without any tax. So you as a reader ought to look at the balance sheet and want to know what are the deferred tax assets or liabilities. Like, it's, a, it's extremely relevant that Yahoo has that giant deferred tax liability. Right? That's one of the, that's the second biggest thing on their balance sheet behind the investment in Alibaba. So understanding what those deferred taxes represent, that's, that's important. <clears throat> okay, so this, um, the next slide where we talk about deferred tax assets. So let's keep going with the example where we have um, an NOL. Okay, so pick a company that's been losing lots of money. Who loses money? Uber. <laughs> Pick a public company. What's that? Amazon. Oh, they make money. Amazon. Who's that? Uh, 3D printing. 3D printing? Uh, maybe. Pick a company everyone. Okay, here's a company I pick on. AMD. <laughs> right? Yeah, you, you guys compete with AMD, kind of, right? <laughs> to the extent that you pay attention to them. Yeah. Okay. So AMD has been around forever, right? And I think they've lost money for like 30 years, I think. <laughs> yeah. And um, so they have NOLs, right? And you would think, that is fantastic, right? <laughs> like I've got some great news for you, AMD, right? You have NOLs, so you're gonna save a ton of tax in the future, right? So, that's good. That's like the opposite of uh, Yahoo and Alibaba, right? Because with them, they're like, you're going to pay a lot of tax. This is not good. But with AMD, you're like, this is awesome, right? So why is it not that awesome? What is the problem? I know, but you're jumping ahead. You don't need NOLs <laughs> unless you have income, right? It's like having a lot of wallpaper without a house, <laughs> right? So with NOLs, sure, those are deferred tax assets, but you only book deferred tax assets on the face of the financial statements if they're worth anything to you, okay? And these are my words, right? Like the, the words that the FASB guidance uses is that you're more likely than not to realize them, right? And so if you looked at AMD and you said, oh, you've got a lot of NOLs, so those NOLs are DTAs, well, are you more likely than not to realize them? That would be pretty hard to say, right? Because they've been losing money for a long time. And I don't follow them closely. Like, I don't know their facts exactly. I just know that they've lost money a lot. So for a company that had lost money for the last, like, decade or two, you'd think, well, we shouldn't show the reader this big asset because, I mean, that's not necessarily an asset that, they should place value in, right? Like if you put cash, accounts receivable, giant NOL, those assets might have different values. 
and that NOL might have a value of close to nothing. Right? And there are rules that prevent other companies from buying them just to get their NOLs. And so it's hard to just put a value on the NOLs equal to what maybe the conceptual or theoretical value might be. Okay? So not all deferred tax assets are created alike. And so this reference to the term valuation allowance on this slide means, and we'll talk about this in another class. In fact, I think we talk about it next class. Um, it means that when we show the financial statements, we only record deferred tax assets net of a valuation allowance. And a valuation allowance basically haircuts DTAs to the amounts that we think we're more likely than not to realize. Okay? Our homework assignment for next week will be a company that has a valuation allowance. And you, we're going to talk about why that company has a valuation allowance. Okay, so I think you got the hang of the fact that the assets are future deduction, liabilities are future income. Um, these are examples of types of deferreds. I think we sort of got this through the feud game and just through talking through some of the examples. Okay, so let's do example two. It's, it's 9.35. So here's what I'm going to do. For those of you who want to split, you can split. And I'm going to go through what the homework is first. And then for those of you who want to stay, we'll do in-class exercise two together. Okay. So uh, the homework for the next class. So there's a bunch of reading. Um, Kate's going to send out more problems. Um, the first night's homework hopefully seemed really easy to you, so the next homework should be a little more challenging. Um, but again, I think you're going to find that the exercises are sort of just like the problems we're doing in class. But like I was doing up there on the board with that one example, and I could tell you guys were all like, I got nothing, you know. I want you to do the problems by yourself and try to make sure you get from beginning to end, right? Do step one, two, three, do the rate rack do the balanced journal entries. And if you want more practice, just go change the facts. Change all the numbers around and add a couple new facts and do it all again. Right? Just tweaking a few things will challenge you uh, enough so that you have to just practice the mechanics. Like make up your own problems. It doesn't matter. Um, but the more you practice uh, and the more you get the balanced journal entry and the rate rec to work at the end of the day, the better you'll feel, the more confident you'll be. Um, so that I would recommend highly. Um, in addition, so two things. One is uh, read the Electronic Arts 10K. Um, they have a March year end. And um, they have a valuation allowance. But they're interesting because um, their valuation allowance, they've had losses for quite a long time. But I want you to tell me why they're still in a valuation allowance. Okay, so that'll be the first question I ask you when you guys come to class next week: is why do they still have a valuation allowance? Because they're not like they're not like AMD. And so my hint to you is, since they have a March year end, you can pick up some of their 10 Qs between March and now and sort of see how they're doing. Okay, but take a look at last year, take a look at the last quarter, and then. Tell me why you think they still have a valuation allowance. Okay. The other thing that's interesting about um, EA is, um, and again, this is public disclosure, but when companies announce earnings, they announce earnings through a press release and they file an 8K with the SEC. And that information is unaudited. But with EA, you might take a look at what they say their tax expense is in their press release and compare it to their 10Q or their 10K. And there's a difference. And see if you can figure out the difference. Okay? You guys understand what I'm asking? So when a company announces their earnings, 
which again is a big part of being a public company. They say, hey, we just finished our year end, here's our earnings, we're doing great. Um, the press release is usually like a dozen pages long. Look at all the places that they describe tax and explain why the tax that they ultimately explain in the press release is different than the uh, 10K. Uh, they're a March year end, so they release in May sometime. Well, it'll be a 10K in May because their year end is March. So they'll issue their 10K a month and a half or so after year end. And so when you look in the, if you just go to the EA website and you pull up the investor relations section, and their 10K will be issued probably in May sometime. Their press release will probably be in the end of April, something like that. Oh, press release for the full year. Press release for the full oh, year. Okay. Yeah. It's tr the, the same phenomenon will be true every quarter, but look at year end. Understand how they communicate taxes in their press release is my point compared to the 10K. It's sort of unique. Okay. So why do they still have a valuation allowance? Why is the tax expense that they describe in their press release, why is it different than what's in their 10K? Okay, those are two questions I'm definitely going to ask you. The other thing you can see listed here above uh, the assignment number two is I want you to find the world's largest valuation allowance. I used to give out a prize for the person who found the world's largest valuation allowance. And like all week I would hype it up as like the coolest prize ever. And then I would make this T-shirt that said, you know, like those like I Heart New York T-shirts. <laughs> I would make a T-shirt that says I Heart My Tax Professor. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, actually, one woman wore it to class. I'm like, that is too much. You should not do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, don't hold out hope for that. So, um, but no, I want you to find the world's largest tax valuation allowance. And because what we're going to do is we're going to talk about why they have them. Like, why does one company have a valuation allowance? Why does a different company have it? We wanted, I want to get, like, the stories of why there are valuation allowances. That's the purpose of the exercise. Okay, and then there's more problems to do.